I, I, there's always Checked. a dilemma when it comes to customer experience. And the dilemma is that, do I know enough? So much is happening and things are changing so fast. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's always a question whether you're up to date. Uh, so the customer journey will continue to evolve. And uh, you know, traditional ways of sales and service is transforming significantly. And uh, this, uh, this change has been multifold post, obviously, the pandemic era that we've seen, the difficult times. I think the explosion of digital uh, technologies and the way uh, they, this is transforming the choices that customers have, um, you know, how do they sort of shop, eat, um, uh, you know, transact has completely changed uh, over the last couple of years. And if we were to keep this in context, um, I think customer expectations are disrupting. So we, always, we always say banking, financial services is disrupting, but I truly believe that customer expectations are, are changing and disrupting how uh, uh, digital leaders uh, uh, see, um, uh, see their set of customers and interact with their customers. And um, customers don't really now relate to age, gender, socioeconomic factors, but it's more about mindset and goals. So um, I would like to be categorized uh, in, in how I think, how I behave, rather than, you know, what's my gender, what's my age, where do I belong to, and so on. I think this poses a significant challenge to uh, customer experience leaders, and more so in financial services, because financial services uh, uh, has been traditionally, uh, you know, uh, looking at customers differently. And now, when uh, there's so much of innovation happening in some of the other uh, in industries, I think the challenge remains. Uh, so, with that, uh, you know, I'm I'm very very excited to have uh, the esteemed panel here with me. Um, maybe I'll I'll begin with. Uh, a simple question to all three of you. COVID has, uh, or the pandemic has changed the way customer expectations, uh, um, if, I mean, it's customer, customer expectations and how it's panned out. What are some of the top uh, customer experience priorities for your organizations? And how do you really balance between, uh, you know, what customers want and limited resources that you have? So maybe I'll, I'll start with you. Hey, hi. Good evening, everyone. So, uh, I'm Shweta. Uh, so, if you see the demography of the customers, normally from banking end, right, there are two set of demographics. One is the ETB, the existing to bank, and the other one is the new to bank customers, right? Now, new to bank, where that onboarding journeys we need to think about, and when this you know, pandemic started two years ago, right, that time we saw that there is a you know, huge surge in the journey where that lending products and especially the lending products were have been on a huge demand, right? And we also noticed that the journey span or journey time, it was a huge factor because if the journey time is long, right? And if the journey is not an STP one, the straight through process is not there, customer gets dropped. And once the customer gets dropped, he will never come back because there is a competitive market, right? And with all due respect to of our uh, peer banks, right, or even that fintech or NBFCs, the way they have, you know, uh, diversified their journeys, the way they are coming up with the new you know, innovations is very competitive. So to create a stickiness for the customer, your uh, journey span should be very less, right? I, I just heard someone was talking about the five minutes of onboarding time for a savings account, right? So similarly for lending products also, we should have a very uh, lesser time, and that's what we have done. Especially a product which I have built in my bank is the digital FD product, where non-access bank customers, they can also open their account, right? If someone wants to put their money on access bank, on a trust factor, we cannot uh, tell him that you should have an account with us. Without an access bank account also, we should let them book their FD, right? So that digital FD product also we build, it's a complete STB product where we use the video KYC, we use the Cersei database, where the CKYC FDs also gets booked, right? So this STP journey which we have created, that's a experience. Also from the corporate per se, if you see, and API is one of the uh, key factor here, because corporates, they are coming up with the 
straight through process of transaction where they don't want to log into the corporate internet banking platform. They want to do all these transactions to be carried out from their own ecosystem. So for that also, we have created open APIs. And with this open API, corporates can you know, carry out the transaction from their ecosystem. They can reconcile the transaction. And that's why we have reduced the time. Right. This one for the NTB and ETB. In ETB also, there is a ring fencing required. Right. Once a customer is with you, it's your responsibility to give the best of best experience to him. Right. So this ring fencing is also a key factor. So these are the you know, key parameters we kept in our mind, and that's how we are doing it for the last few years. Sure. So I think, I think the key theme is that you do not let the customer go. You drive stickiness. Um, if I were to come to you, I think uh, uh, banks, yes, uh, it's always, customer experience is always spoken about, but in insurance, what are some of your priorities? Thanks, uh, thanks, Shweta. So uh, we have been here in uh, India for almost uh, 15 years, future generally, and I'm a part of the general insurance sector. Uh, generally itself has been there for almost uh, close to two centuries uh, globally, uh, our parent company. Uh, when we talk about insurance and uh, whether it was during COVID, prior to COVID or after COVID, the reference does keep going there that uh, what behaviors changed. Uh, did they change for people to become more relaxed? No. When a pandemic happens, people are more alert. Uh, people's demands become higher. And also new ways of uh, doing business and communication emerge. So uh, while everyone was going the digital way, Prior to pandemic, everyone wanted to cut down, like our bank counterparts uh, to left and right. I'm sure all the sprawling spaces of banks, they would have reduced to smaller banks, except for maybe the public sector banks. In uh, insurance also, customers now prefer digital first. So all those uh, apps, all those uh, digital policy issuance tools which we had developed, they spiked in their usage. That is one behavior change which happened. Uh, customers now expect to be connected all the time around, and they are not okay with receiving uh, non-customized communication, non-relevant communication. You have to personalize it. You have to make it relevant to them. And uh, in insurance, which is like uh, traditionally jargonic and uh, terms and conditions of a contract, now they want it to be simplified to them to understand this mein mujhe mil kya hai and uh, how will it play out in the time of the moment of truth Claim. So those basics remain, but the way customer goes around that has changed. So as an organization, we have uh, evolved a lifetime partner uh, strategy, and that's uh, a strategy which uh, goes over a long term, because you are not here uh, for a day. You have to be there with them uh, long term. And there we have uh, looked at three customer promises. The first is to look at creating an effortless and caring experience. So uh, really, like it should be in a zap. Of course, uh, in insurance, you have to go through various hoops. And this effortless and caring experience has to be both for the customer and uh, also the partner. Because insurance is very much B2B2C. So end customer is going to go to an agent or to a dealer or to a bank and how you have enabled this. So he earlier uh, talked about APIs. So similarly, my agent would be issuing uh, policies at his end, so what kind of uh, uh, structure I have provided to him, how easily he can uh, do that with light APIs. Uh, then secondly, apart from effortless and caring experience, we are looking at uh, value-added services, the entire ecosystem, because no one is looking at insurance only as a pure insurance. So if you are talking about health, people are looking at the wellness, they are looking at the OPD coverage. If you are looking at uh, a motor car, they want the roadside assistance. They want other coverages which will make them totally uh, like insured. So that's a behavior and people are okay to pay a little premium over there. So you have to have differentiated value proposition there. And finally, a uh, physical advice and where again I talked about our partners. So how do you enable them to offer physical advice? So when they are going to the customer, they can really see all the information you have to offer and they can at their end issue the policy at the earliest time. So we track the percentage digital policies that I issued. And we look at what the lifetime value of the customer remains with us. So not only coming in one time, but how they are going to do a multi-product, 
and uh, long term business with us. So uh, these are the priorities and which we will continue for a longer term. Uh, of course, customers behaviors will uh, keep evolving. But if we keep working on the basics, then somewhere there will be a match between the behavior and the priorities. So the experience servicing um, and the engagement all three matters. Um, if I were to come to you, Deepak, uh, yeah. what, so we spoke about uh, uh, priorities and, you know, tech priorities is always a conundrum, right? Uh, because there's so much happening in this space. How do you look at prioritizing? Thanks, Shweta. Um, see, let's be honest, okay, banks and insurance never took to digital by design. Okay, we were forced to do it because we had the pandemic that, you know, came and hit us. Uh, so, you know, we had to operate with physical, um, um, you know, physical distancing. We had limitations on, on geography. There were lockdowns. Um, there were health scares and people, you know, obviously had tendencies uh, to work out of home and they did not know what to do. But, uh, you know, banking and financial services are part of essential services of the country. So, therefore, we are almost as good as the front line. So, we had to basically up, up the game. So, we, you know, banks really became work from home in, in one week, which is like unheard of. I mean, we've never had a banker working from home. Banker always used to work out of our branch, right? So that's how it was. Um, but yeah, I think because RBL has always been in the forefront of open banking, we've had the API stack much before the pandemic. And we, you know, we have this moniker of, uh, you know, partner ka bank. So we used to work with a plethora of fintech partners. Uh, so for us, the transition was easier. Uh, but it is important that there were a, there were a few th things that we had to get right, like reliability and availability, just purely talking from a tech uh, standpoint, because customers today have, uh, you know, really jumped on to digital like, you know, you couldn't imagine, right? Uh, you know, if, if we, you know, when we were looking back and analyzing some of our data sets, you know, the first, I think, eight, nine months of the pandemic, just after the second wave, our UPI transactions, and in fact, I was sharing with some of my colleagues with IDBI here, you know, our UPI transactions went up by like some 27x, right? And how could you ever predict that UPI transactions will, will uh, you know, increase by so much? How do you scale for it? How do you design for software systems and so forth, right? Um, but yeah, like I said, you know, because we were prepared, um, you know, we had the, the, the foundation was there. It is just that uh, it, was, um, and it, it was important for us to get the, the customer expectation right. You know, customers are expecting high availability, high reliability of systems. Um, you know, they get very finicky. If somebody, you know, gets down from the airport, if they can't get an Ola Uber within the first three months, um, you know, they get really pissed off in a place like Bombay when it's raining. And, you know, so, you know, they do need that, uh, you know, instant gratification. Uh, so that was the first predicate for us to get this thing right. You know, how do we account for, you know, 99 point 5%, 99.9% availability. You know, 95% availability was used to be like really, you know, top-notch banking five years ago. 95% availability means one day in a, in a month the systems used to be down and customers used to be okay, right? But today we're talking about 99.59s, 99.99s. I was speaking to a friend of mine who runs the, the Australasia business uh, for a leading cards network. He says he has an SLA with the client for 99.99s, right? Which means he can be, his downtime in a month can be one minute at a max. Okay, and he says, I'm already at seven minutes breach. So, you know, and, you know so it, it do, does get complicated. But, you know, customers, you know, have that expectation that when has a customer ever seen a Netflix go down or a Google go down or a Meta go down or a... And Amazon go down. Amazon last went down in 2013. They were down for 40 minutes and they lost something like $50 million of business or $40 million of business. But uh, I think a lot of these uh, companies, you know, my friends here on the panel here, uh, you know, they've all become digitally savvy. But availability, reliability, exceptionally important, uh, you know, imp imperatives part of tech strategy. I think you made a very interesting point, right? Um, and, um, you know, my next question uh, is related. So Google, Amazon gives you recommendations, but the bank that knows exactly where you transact, where you have your coffee, how you behave, hasn't really been able to catch the pulse. And I'm, I'm really hoping that API banking, uh, um, you know, the aggregator uh, licenses will change the way 
this is done. How do you think uh, customer experience is going to change in the era of uh, API banking? See, uh, there are a few aspects on it. One is that when this account aggregator thing will come up more, right? The more uses of uh, consensual data sharing will come up, right? We'll get more data. And based on the data, we can create more, uh, probably a better offer, a personalized offer. Today also we are creating some personalized offer, but these offers are based on the data which we have in our organization, right? The moment we start getting all this data from the outer ecosystem, we can create more hyper-personalized offer for our customers. And also on the underwriting per se. Today, if a non-bank customer, when I'm saying non-bank customer, means he doesn't have any relationship with me. And when he's coming to my bank and he's asking for a, on a lending product or a credit card, right? Whatever the underwriting we are doing, we are doing it on the basis of the data, whatever we have today for him, right? And very less number of data we have. The moment this account aggregator will be a fully rolled out uh, program, and the moment we'll start getting the financial data and all. So that time the underwriting, the uh, no, more uh, STP process will come, right? We'll offer them a uh, lending product a uh, very curated way, right? And at the same time, the NPS, right? Bank's NPA number will also be lessened. Because my conversion will be on the quality of data. Today, the compromise we are having, a less number of compromise, obviously, but still is there. But that, that part will be removed when this account aggregator thing will come. And at the same time, this data and API, right? Both are the uh, most popular currency in the digital economy. The number of APIs you are having, the more better journey you are having, right? The number of experience you can create through your APIs, and obviously the open APIs, right? As he, uh, Deepak was talking about this, you know, up times, right? The 99.9 is the SLA. There are many corporate who are asking for this today because they are having a huge number of API transaction on our gateway, right? And your gateway has to be up and running. Yes, 99.9 percent .9 is a, probably the best number we can provide them, uh, considering the today's context. But that's what it is: that data, API, and the aggregator. These three will go and up together, and this will give us a better journey and better offer for our customer. Right. Thank you so much. I you know, I'll, I'll come to um, uh, you, you know, uh, I always uh, think about this and, you know, insurance and hyper-personalization uh, in customer experiences is like two ends of the pole, right? Do you think that we will eventually move towards it? And if yes, you know, what are some, some, of, what, what are some of the thinking that you have in terms of creating hyper-personalization for customers? Uh, thanks, uh, Shweta. The word hyper-personalization, I mean, the phrase rather, sounds uh, very exciting, but I'll uh, be happy to start with personalization. We can make it uh, hyper uh, eventually. Uh, by uh, virtue, I mean, uh, if you see insurance products, especially in general insurance, first of all, um, a part of that is, like, how do you reward your loyal customers? You want to continue with your existing customers who have been there, with uh, you for a longer term. So insurance uh, in its uh, structure itself bakes that. Someone who has been there with a long term with you and uh, is not prone to claim. For example, in uh, motor business, he's a safe driver. Then he keeps on accumulating and this is not something uh, specific to uh, my insurance company but across insurance organization, he keeps on accumulating a no claim bonus which goes on up to as high as 50% when uh, he has had several years. So there is a reward for that. If you are having a health insurance product, then again you keep on getting cumulative bonus, enhancement of some insured, and continuity benefit some of the diseases that you did not qualify for in the initial year, in the two years, three years. By the fourth year, most of it is uh, getting qualified. So just being there is rewarding with insurance. That, that is, uh, first of all, the nature. Now, to know your customers is very important if you have to personalize. And uh, knowing your customer means uh, having the right insights. Uh, earlier, my friend here was talking about personas, where he was talking about uh, behaviors, attitudes, and not only the demographics, or uh, we need to know the psychographics. Now, to know that, you need to have a well-entrenched insights program into your uh, customer journeys and how you do business. So here we have uh, built two or three layers. One is uh, where you go and benchmark with the market and you look at 
your relational NPS, your brand funnel, or brand and health. That gives you an overall level of how you're doing with others. But I'll talk about the other thing, which is more like a moving or a movie kind of uh, real insights. Like earlier, if you talk about insights, what you'd do is you'd send surveys, you'll accumulate, you'll do data crunching, and voila, maybe in a month or two months, you'd present fantastic reports. Uh, but more important today is to use the insight you are getting now. Here is a claim customer who claimed with you. And after that, within a 24 to 48 hours, if you can get the insight, if he's happy with the way he was treated, if he's happy about the quantum of claim that he got, and what, if anything, were dissonance. One is to get that. But then not wait for aggregating all that data and have a program of uh, closed looping operationally and uh, structurally. Now, that's what we have built. So operationally means if there is a dissonance, that is, there is a detractor, a uh, low scoring customer, you get back to him immediately in 24 to 48 hours, and you understand his pain. Sometimes you may be able to alleviate the pain. Sometimes the pain is emotional because the contract term says that you would not get this and you have not got it. But whether you are able to educate him and at least show that you care. So that is the operational closed loop. And when you keep doing this over a period of time, you accumulate the themes which emerge. And that is where from the closed looping uh, categorizations that you do, the text analytics that you do, from there you like really pick up the themes for the organizations revamping to the customer journeys or ongoing continual improvement uh, journeys. So we do that and all uh, initiatives or investments that we do to change anything for the customer comes from this ongoing journey uh, that is happening. And then finally, uh, talking about hyper-personalization, I touched about it a bit earlier. So while the insurance contract is not going to go away and it may remain complex, there are some things in that which are of top priority to the customer. So we are endeavoring to make uh, the language, at least the covering language, into a high schoolers level. Something like an 8th to 10th class school going uh, person can understand that and which uh, in European framework is called as a B1 simple language. So to present that, the FAQs, and then also to customize that because out of all the offerings that you have, for example in the add-on for the car, there may be some applicable. So you only talk about that. You explain that through video. And that is a personalized experience that you are offering to the customer and where he can uh, choose in his journey. And uh, if you are able to get this done rightly, if you are able to get the communication done correctly, because you have to really think about how much communication is less, how much is optimum, and how much is too much. And uh, whether the communication that one is doing really has the human touch, which is the right mode, and which is the customer's preference to receive that uh, communication. So he is showing a trend that he likes to be contacted in this time frame. He wants to be contacted by these modes. If you are able to get these basics done right, and that's what our focus is, then the personalization is right. And the customer is more than happy because elsewhere if he's uh, experiencing pain, then here it is seamless. And uh, that itself is uh, a good personalization. Very interesting. Um, if I were to see, so you spoke about priorities on, a tech, uh, on the technology side. Uh, so I have two questions for you. The first one being, um, what are the challenges for a modern customer experience leader? And uh, the second one is that, uh, which I believe uh, is, is tricky, is that creating a digital first mindset for your teams uh, is, is always a challenge, but an opportunity as well. How do you look at it? Yeah, I'll take the second question first, I mean, it's easier to, uh, to address. Um, so, you know, about a few years ago, I attended a, a sales training program. I have never been a salesman. Um, you know, I was in a full-time employee, full-time gainfully employed with a, within, a, with an insurance company, and then I decided to quit and do something in the startup space. And so one of the things that I thought I, I lacked was uh, ability to go and sell in the market. Because, you know, as a startup entrepreneur, trying to build your own product, you have to go sell your idea, you have to, you know, raise money, you have to sell your concept to people. Even for you to get your first employee on board, you know, that's a little bit of selling, right? Even, uh, you know, uh, even if I have to say no, that's like, say, I need to sell a no to somebody. So, um, 
So I attended this, it was at the Rice Building and uh, you know, there's a FinTech geek that was going on and it was I think a, a two hour program and at the end of the program, the guy that were, you know, um, the, the person that was conducting the workshop, he said, sales is not relegated to one particular function. Every person in the function, every function, a person in the organization needs to be a sales guy, right? Customer experience is pretty much like that. Um, every person, every person in the value chain needs to be customer centric. You know, end of the day, the business is for the customer, right? Uh, classic case when pandemic hit, we had a large moratorium program that was, uh, you know, thrust upon us. It was one of the financial levers by the government of India, and RBI, um, you know, reacted and put a formal structure in place. All of us in tech also ne needed to understand what moratorium was about. You know, why are people being given moratoriums? Uh, why? What is deferred payments? If customer is calling about their, you know, loan repayments, we had to know how to deal with that particular emotion, how to deal with that particular situation. It's not just about data and statistics, right? So I think the, the human element is extremely important. You know, like insurance, for example, if, if somebody has to just settle a claim, we, if we write an algorithm, and the algorithm basically just decides whether the you know, health score is there and whether uh, you know, it is you know, part of the underwrite, underwritten rule that you know, a claim is admissible or inadmissible. Most of the times that's what's happened, and even in my personal experience, that's what has happened. But yeah, we can't leave it just to the, in the hands of an algorithm to decide the fate of whether a claim needs to be settled or not, because there could be, you know, 100 other human, uh, you know, elements to it. One of the things that we do, um, you know, I propagate, you know, as a philosophy in my team is you go and sit one day in a month at the front lines, at the contact center, at the branch, wherever the customer is walking in, uh, to try and understand what is it that they're going through. Um, and that's worked well for us. You know, I've been part of many conversations where uh, you know customer calls and yells, and you are just trying to understand how you can solve that pers that person's outcome, right? So this happened. You know, you know a very famous yesterday cricketer. He, you know, he's part of the 1983 World Cup. I don't want to take his name, but he, you know, he's one of our customers at RBL. Um, he called through uh, an executive friend, and he was he was blowing his top because. Something did not work. Right? He said, Deepak, you know, I'm not a tech guy. Um, I just want to set up a simple, you know, I want to just tag your RBL account to Google Pay. And it did not work. He tried apparently some 13 times and he sent a screenshot. He said, I'm not able to send money to my driver. Um, and that's all he needs. He said, there, you know, there's some technology problem. You'll have to solve for it. So I said, okay, I'll solve for it. You know, I went back to him after 24 hours, uh, figured that there was a problem with, uh, you know, he was using a different. PSB provider, not RBL at all. I, you know, actually, it was not my issue, but I couldn't tell him that. Because uh, today, when you're using Google Pay, there's like seven, eight legs of that transaction. It can, you know, the failure points can happen at any point. It can happen at the bank, it can happen at NC, N, NPCI, it can happen at the PSP provider, it can happen at the recipient bank. You know, any, the journey can just drop at any point in time and the transaction will fail. But you are expected to answer because he's your customer at the end of the day. He has an OD, he has you know, a couple of deposits, and he's a, he's a you know, celebrity cust customer. Um, so he said, okay, I'm coming to Bombay tomorrow. I have a commentary, and you come and explain to me. Okay. I said, you know, but should I send my customer service agent? He said, no, no, why don't you come over? We'll have coffee, you still solve the problem for me. So I went, and uh, he, you know, he was, I had nothing to do with the problem at all. So. He said, but uh, can you tell me what phone do you use? He said, I'm using a Samsung FE20 and I don't know how to use this palm screen to take a screenshot. So then I went and researched, okay, what is this particular model of Samsung where there is a palm that you know helps one capture a screenshot. And um, then he said, I can't go to YouTube and go, or, and, or to, uh, I can't go and Google and figure out how to set up my GPA account. Can you please send me a video? So, so I actually ended up voice recording a video, six steps of how to go and set up somebody, set up a Google account with RBL bank account. And he said, you know, send it to me in this vernacular language because I don't understand Hindi. Now you would have guessed who the cricketer is. But that's what it is. I mean, that's what customer expects. Today, they expect the agent to know how technology works because it's no longer just, uh, you know, products. Like, you know, Mr. Mrithinjoy explained, it's no longer about you know, savings and deposits and wealth management and, and uh, you know, DMAT account and all that. that. So every bank has. 
All 2,000 banks have, all 3,000 fintech companies in India will have. Uh, the key differentiator is the experience. How do we do identity? How do we do, you know, how do we present information in a manner that the customer understands? And how do we create that experience? So that, I think, is, is what, uh, um, you know, something that I learned. And that's something that we propagate to people in my teams, whether they are in, they are in technology or risk management or, uh, um, you know, underwriting or operations. Uh, they have to be customer centric. Today, we have no choice. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. I think that's hyper personalization in the true sense, <laughs> right? Really sitting with the customer, understanding, uh, and really empathizing. Um, before we move on, uh, I'd like to invite Mr. Mohopatra to come on stage. Just taking from where uh, you know Deepak was talking about uh, the digital mindset, and you know customers are e um, you know they're expecting more than what we've delivered traditionally, uh, and and of course financial services in, is interoperable, right? Uh, how do you how do you uh, ensure that the customer sticks to you, and uh, what are some of the areas that you're deploying which which ensures this? Well, so I think what Deepak said, let's like just take this journey ahead. The customer engagement started from the onboarding, right? The moment you start onboarding him before he became a customer, that experience really matters. If that is very smooth and we have a very seamless journey and this bindingness is increases kind of thing. I'll take a few examples on this side. And this digital, previously we all talk about this. But during the pandemic, there is no choice. It has been forced to, everybody has to adapt if you are into a business, right? So that's what I say. Coming to this point when we start, and this is what my experience here, is nothing right, written that this is the 10 point that has to be followed to be success in the digital journey. Every day is a learning. Today, I just come from a meeting only just recently, that was a same thing happened in the digital onboarding experience I'm talking about. Then the, this is the, earlier, there was a kind of one set defined that you need to do this documentation and this process and the sign and yes, you are onboarded as an account holder of a financial institution, right? Right now what is happening, a lot of regulation changes and fintech coming out. What is the minimal step you need from the customer to get him onboarded? So that is the key challenge. And how seamlessly you can do that one? I just came for the discussion, I just like telling what is that one? We are trying to do something where you want to verify this is the customer, same customer, and try to send out an SMS or kind of message automatically from the system, that is app. Some of those rules say that not allowed. I'm talking about various apps and app stores on this side. To build a customer journey seamlessly, we have to find out how best we can do that, whether customer can click it or automatically goes back, what is the minimum step, what you are tracking now, maximum five, minimum three, how we can complete the onboarding journey. So that's what we're trying to do on this side, and I come from that discussion. It's a long debate going on, what to do as a regulatory and what not to do. And coming to the point what you ask, ma'am, on this side, how do you stick and how to enforce the customer to stick to you? Is always, I see, say, engagement, right? We cannot do advertisement. There's a certain kind of rules and regulations happens on this side. Engagement means you're talking about how do we keep on engaging to the customers it might be notifications, might be pampering, what kind of thing, and back-end analytics plays a very important role. To understand the customer, what type of customer he is, and what is his need, and what he's doing. Then only you give the right kind of product, right kind of pitch, so that he is with you and continue with you, and keep him engaging with you, and give him what he wants. Don't pamper him, or don't kind of give whatever not required as general uh, kind of marketing tools or marketing promotions, that's what I am saying. Sure. Um, so, you know, we missed you during the first round. So maybe maybe if you could call out three priorities that you have uh, uh, in customer experience for your organization, that'd be great. One thing I'll say that ki customers decide their own time when they want to reach out to you. You should be available by any means what his customer is comfortable. There is no way that I can say that my call center times are 9 to 6, please call me or I'll call me on Monday or Saturday, Sunday, we are off. Those days gone, right? We have to give what the customer has the time when he wants to reach. That's the priority one. 
Second, as I say that, ki, keep the customer engaged. Whatever the financial product we are in, whatever kind of services we are in, or any industry, keep the customer always in your contact. Sometime, every time create a mindset that, or create a kind of knock, knock on the door kind of thing, I am there for you, for anything, so that ki, any brand value or the organization recall has to be first in customer mind for any set. So that is engagement. Third thing, I will talk about the customer experience kind of thing. All these two things are basically customer initiative or expect, expecting something customer to do for us. The third is what we give back to the customer. That is the experience where the practitioner is saying that the experience what he personalization, hyper personalization, he gone back. So that experience matter that he always learn that he what improvement we can do. So I think these are the three things we will take care of. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I'll conclude with the last uh, quick uh, summary from all of you. What would be your mantra or advice to any organization that's looking to revamp, rewire customer experience? Sure, thanks. See, um, first of all, we need to create a benchmark, right? What all uh, other players are providing to the customer and what best you can give the customer, right? And you'll have to create an engagement layer where customers should feel that you can actually you know, have that you know, empathic glory for the customer. Right, as Deepak was rightly said, and this happened in many of other banks also, right? I mean, people who are day in, day out dealing with multiple customers, they have this type of experiences, right? And in digital cases, there are experiences where we have seen uh, people want a self-service portal, right? For example, the API developer portal which we have, where the developers are coming today and, I mean, one year back, I'm talking about the story of a one year back, right? People are coming and they were applying for the APIs. And there, is a, there was a team in our bank who were actually approving the request. Then when we act, uh, made that a self sign up portal, when developers are coming off their own, they are playing around the APIs, they're testing this API in the sandbox. And we see a, there is a huge number of uh, sign up. We saw a very huge number of API utilization, right? And this actually created a self, you know, an awareness that customer wants a self sign up portal. Right. This is one part. The second part is that two, three years ago, when we were partnering with multiple fintechs and we are, you know, offering our lending APIs or deposit APIs, we saw the journey starts at partner end. That onboarding is done, then the customer will be transferred back to bank, and bank will do all the, you know, servicing and all. But nowadays, for last one and a half year, we have observed that fintechs they are not only requesting for the onboarding APIs. At the same time, they are looking for the you know, returning services. For example, if a partner is working with us for a FD opening API, right? He also wants that FD maturity or you know renewal services also in their app. So it's a complete bouquet of service we need to provide to the customer. We cannot ask our customer to you know, go to some app for a few of the services and uh, to our app for other services, right? So the entire ecosystem will have to open with your gateway and the experience which you are offering to a customer, it should be should have a good delight for your customer as well as a stickiness should be there, right? Yeah. So uh, revamping, I'm sure that uh, uh, I'm no one as an advisory, and uh, everyone have their own great strategies. Um, but maybe I'll uh, present a four-point framework, and I'd suggest to always start with uh, employees because. Uh, all those uh, technologies that you're going to put in, all the framework, all the journeys, how passionate the people who have to deliver these services feel about. So if you start with uh, the employees and the culture, your work would have been half done because they'll figure out a way. So this frame, uh, four step framework, uh, the first is to like really see yourself as the customer does in organizations and uh, corporates. We often end up uh, like, uh, fooling ourselves, feeling that uh, my turnaround time is this, my delivery is this, and these are the best. First of all, is the customer really wanting that turnaround time, or is he expecting that thing? So what does he really want? Have a strong insight program across that, and do a testing using operational and uh, financial linkage. So check out, like, uh, at what is the breaking point where maybe the service is really being felt and which makes a bad experience to him. Then wiring the customer in every decision is the second point of the framework. So you're going to make an investment. You are going to uh, maybe buy your software or you're going to develop a new kind of model. Uh, he talked about bringing the customer on site. There are various other ways 
to do a testing with the customer. Does it really make sense to them? And then there has to be a accountability. The third would be driving accountability at all levels. So you have a program uh, which is customer journeys or insights or IT or whatever, but is it linked into the KPI of everyone from the CEO to the front line? We do that in our organization where the CX insights that we get in a customized format, it's not uh, one uh, answer for all, gets linked to everyone's performance in a different way. So even an HR guy, like he talked about speaking to customer, he has to make certain amounts of call to the customer to understand how can he make the hiring better or what is the pipeline there. And uh, then finally, if you are doing all of these, then you have to be on a journey of continual improvement if you can innovate continuously at a scale. So everyone, I am sure, prides on their innovation, but you have to keep scaling it and bring it to adoption. So I feel if these are four things that organizations who may be starting on their CX framework can implement, they would have mostly needed it if they can pursue the journey throughout. Yeah, given that you know, it's a flavor of frameworks, there are already two big frameworks that we just spoke about. You know, I was reading up this uh, survey by survey monkey. I didn't know survey monkey actually does surveys. But, um, you know, they came up with this, uh, like we have the roti kapra makan, there's a hierarchy of customer centricity. Uh, and they called it uh, empathy, impact, customer at the top of the mind, employee satisfaction, customer satisfaction. It's quite, uh, it's quite nice and I actually memorized it because this is exactly the formula that any company that is looking to draw customer experience programs grounds up really need to be uh, doing you know when I walked into the uh, to the BFSA next conference and I was not carrying any visiting cards I don't remember the last time that I printed a visiting card ever but I had to you know I had to you know basically give my identity and I was speaking up with this person and then she gave me like a bunch of paperwork right and I said I, you know this is like a digital conference why are you loading me with paperwork right my customer experience is I don't need paper so there's one of those stalls that had actually put up a QR code. I thought that was like quite a, a very interesting feature. So I just opened my phone and opened my camera. It has default QR code reader. And it read the QR code and it actually uh, sent me to a WhatsApp channel. I thought that was great customer experience. And then I just put a hi and then after 20 minutes I get some, I, I got a very rude response. And I thought, okay, they have done the tech part, right? Maybe the human element is something that they need to get, right? But so, I mean, I'm not, I didn't mean to take a, a gripe at this person. I'm not going to name the person. But yeah, but this is, I think, one part of the journey done so beautifully well. But the other part of the journey that has gone wrong. So if we get the tech part and the experience part, then I think it's going to be a win-win as far as our customer is concerned. Uh, I'll summarize on that, uh, I think the digital experience, basically one side is a human and one side is a kind of system over expecting something to do. So what is this made path is that, and always we believe as a customer, he always likes to do things himself. Very, sometimes it might be a concern, if I ask somebody to fill up a form, he'll like to fill up himself. There is a kind of concern, you might be feel some wrong data, some, some wrong information. It is always customer like to keep his data secret with him and wherever required he want to share himself. And the trust factor is the machine behind who is receiving all this data. So we have to kind of do a very kind of uh, handshaking between these humans and uh, the systems and what you say that um, uh, the mid path is the experience what system cannot build where the human touch is required. That experience if you had put it, so probably you are through in the achievement. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. I think this was a very, very interesting discussion. So I end this with a few uh, takeaways. Connected experiences, engagement, consistency, empathy, uh, customization, efficiency, and uh, maybe reach. Uh, thank you once again for joining me here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for moderating. Thank you. Thank you thank so you. much.